Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Math 301. And today we're doing section 11.4, which is about the platonic solids. And then we also will talk again about torus graphs at the end. So some of you have probably seen the platonic solids before. You can find them on Wikipedia or in the textbook. We've got the tetrahedron, four vertices, four faces. We've got the cube. It's got eight vertices, six faces. Octahedron has eight faces. The dodecahedron has 12 faces. The icosahedron has 20 faces. The dodecahedron, all the faces are are regular pentagons, and the icosahedron, the faces are all regular triangles. So what is a platonic solid? A platonic, a planet, platonic solid is a polyhedron, so that means its faces are made up of, of flat shapes, and we want all those polyhedron, we want all those faces to be the same. And not only do we want them to be the same, we want uh, the those faces to all be regular, meaning that the edges all have to have the same length and the angles all have to be the same. So for example, the cube is made out of six squares that are exactly the same as each other. But we also need it to be convex, which means that somehow the interior, these faces need to enclose uh, um, a, a shape that has there has there can't be anything missing in the middle. And more precisely, if you take any two points on the outside of the shape and draw a line between them, that line should be contained within the shape. That's what it means to be convex. Here's a fun animation of the dodecahedron. You can see a little bit more of the three visual, 3D visual aspects of it as these as this shape made up of these pentagons moves around. Okay, so those are the platonic solids. And one thing that's kind of cool about the platonic solids is that they, since they're regular, they all have the same distance. Um, the, the vertices all have the same distance to a center point. And so they can all be drawn on a sphere. So let me um, now share another picture. So, Let's, for instance, look at um, a sphere. Let's, let's draw a sphere. And we'll just take the cube as an example. We can draw the cube on the sphere by putting a one point in each of the eight um, quadrants. Now the edges are gonna go a little bit into the middle of the sphere, but that's that's somehow okay initially. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the first time I've sneezed on one of these on the, one of these videos. So you can see from my incredibly accurate picture here that these eight vertices are all on the outside of the sphere. And if you wanted, you could put the edges on the sphere too by somehow just puffing them out a little bit so that they they curve so that they curve around. So, all right. So you can tell that that's drawn that's drawn on the sphere. Okay. So one um, if we're drawing this on a sphere, we might want to ask something about this cube. We might want to ask how many vertices, edges, and faces it has. And we can see, for instance, that the cube has eight vertices, 12 edges, and six faces. And for the five platonic solids, you can uh, go and for each of them, count the number of vertices, edges, and faces, and then uh, count um, compute the Euler characteristic, which you remember is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. And each time we get the number two. And that that is not a coincidence because in fact, it turns out that um, a graph can be drawn on the sphere. without crossing edges. If and only if 
um, it can be drawn on the plane. without crossing edges, meaning that it's planar. So planar graphs are the same as spherical graphs. And the way this works is with the idea of stereographic projection, which if you take geometry, you'll learn about in more detail the exact formulas from this. Here we don't so much need the exact formulas, but we just want to pick one point and we want to imagine shining a very bright light from that point and projecting that down to a piece of paper. And when we do that, here's a piece of paper. When we do that, what we see is that the um, maybe I should have drawn, maybe I'll draw this a little bigger. So we've got the, we've got the sphere. And we have the, the cube on the sphere. One vertex in each uh, quadrant. And now we're shining this bright light from the North Pole. And the shadow that this creates, well, these, these four, so the bright light shines directly down to here, but that's not a, a point. And instead we just have these four vertices are gonna look like a square like that. And then these four vertices are gonna be a little further out because the light as they shine is gonna shine this a little further out. Okay, and so this is the projection that, that you're gonna make. And under that projection, you can see that each vertex on the sphere becomes a vertex on the plane and each edge on the sphere, which I should have drawn a little more curvy, uh, becomes an edge on the plane. And each face on this becomes a face in the a face in the plane. And so this is a picture that from the perspective of the cube shows that spherical graphs are the same af after projection as planar graphs. And since the number of vertices and the number of edges and the number of faces doesn't change, these both have Euler characteristic two. So let's go back um, to this chart of data because there's one other thing that's not really combinatorics that I wanted to share with you, which is the idea of a dual, a dual, um, graph, or at least the dual of a platonic solid. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the cube, and then from each, on each of its faces, we're going to draw the center. Okay, so here's the cube. All right, and so on each face, we're gonna draw the center of that face. So let's do that in red. We have six faces, and so we have six red dots. This one is on the front face, this one's on the back face. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to connect all of those dots, all those red dots with an edge. But we're not gonna connect every dot with every other dot. What we're gonna do is to say, if two faces share an edge, then we will connect them with an edge. So for instance, the top and the right face share an edge. So we're gonna connect these two centers with an edge. 
but the top and the bottom don't share an edge, so we won't connect them. So this dot on the bottom is going to connect with the four dots for the four uh, sides, and the dot, dot on the top is going to connect with the dots for the four sides, and then each side connects with two of the others. And what you see here is that we just drew another platonic solid, and in particular, it's the octahedron. It's the one with six vertices, 12 edges, and eight faces. And so we say that the cube and the octahedron are dual to each other because this process of putting vertices in faces and connecting them in the right way changes the graph of the cube to a graph of an octahedron. And then if we did this again, if we put a, a dot in the center of each of the octahedron's faces, we would then have eight dots. And if you were to draw the correct edges between those dots, you would again get the cube. Smaller cube, but still a cube. So the cube and the octahedron are dual. It turns out that the dodecahedron and icosahedron are also dual. And one way of seeing that is that notice how the numbers for the number of vertices and the number of faces have switched. There's a really um, fun proof that the five, these five platonic solids are the only possible platonic solids, but it's quite a time consuming proof, so we won't do it in this course. So we've just seen that spherical graphs are the same as planar graphs. There's also a connection between the graphs on a torus and graphs on the Pac-Man board. Remember the torus is the outer shell of a donut And the Pac-Man board is a flat piece of paper, but where the top edge connects to the bottom edge and the left edge connects to the right edge. And the way you can do this is if, if you have some kind of graph on a torus, what you do is you make a cut and this cut, you could first uh, cut, cut it along this way, along that, and that cuts your torus into a cylinder. And then you can cut that uh, cylinder around one side, and that cuts it into a flat man, flat piece of paper. And any graph on a torus then would just get carried along, carried along for the for the ride. So for instance, let's say you had this this graph and then you wanted to make a little square and then connect these two edges like that and then connect this with that that way. Then how would you draw that? This may not be exactly perfect, but you would, you know, have this little square here, and then one of the edges crosses over the pink line. And so if it does that, it would have to come back onto the other side, and the other edge crosses the green line, and so it would come around like that. So that's how graphs on a torus are the same as graphs on a Pac-Man board. And what I'd like to end with today is talk about what is the Euler characteristic of these kinds of graphs. So let's do this, this example of this graph we drew. So how many vertices does this have? Well, it has four vertices. How many edges? Well, let's count them. So we have the four that make a cycle around this vert vertex. And then this edge that goes off the bottom and comes in from the top, that's just one edge, even though it's been drawn in two pieces. 
And this one that goes off the left and comes in on the right, that's also one edge that's been cut into two pieces. So we have six edges. And then how many faces? We have one face that's in the middle. Let's call that face A. And then it looks like we have four faces in the four corners. But we need to be a little careful here because remember that this side connects up with this side. So this lower right corner connects up with the lower left corner because if you go off the right, you come in on the left. Similarly, if you go down the bottom, you'll come in the top. So in fact, even though this looks like four different faces, they're all connected to each other by moving over this pink and the green. Okay, so in fact, there's only there are only two faces. And so the Euler characteristic, which is V minus E plus F is four minus six plus two, which is zero. Let's do another example. Here I'm going to fill in the, these four corners of the Pac-Man board. And put one more vertex in the middle. And then I'll draw these edges here. And I'm going to include these pink and green edges at the top and bottom and left and right. Okay, so let's try to count what's going on. So here, we definitely have four different faces. Let's label them A, B, C, and D, because I've expressly chosen edges to separate the top from the, the bottom. So four faces. Looks like we've got um, five vertices, five points. But now we have to be a little, a little careful here. Well, let's just guess how many edges do we have? It looks like we have one, two, three, four. Looks like we have eight. But, but now, now, it, now we have to be a little careful. Let's label the edges. One, two, three, and four go out from the center part. But this fifth edge is green. So it's the same as this edge that's green on the other. That's the whole point, is that that green thing, those were identified together on the Pac-Man board. And this pink edge at the top is the same as the pink edge at the bottom. So it turns out I don't really have eight edges. I only have six. Similarly, notice that this point is the one point which is at the intersection, the end of this pink line. So it's the same as this point here. And that's the, the one that's at the same, which is at the end of the green line. That's the same as this point. In fact, all four of those points are the same. They are the point where the pink circle and the green circle intersect on the torus. So I don't really have five vertices. In fact, I only have two, the one in the center. And then these four are just each, they're like each like a quarter of a point, which is like sliding off to be the same as the others. Okay, and so here the Euler characteristic is 2 minus 6 plus 4, and it turns out that that is 0. And in fact, here's the theorem, is that any graph on a torus or a Pac-Man board has Euler characteristic 0. So if you ever take a course in topology, you might see that this Euler characteristic is a topological invariant. So it only depends on a, a surface up to um, homeomorphism. All right, that's all for today.